to get my son? Or no, no, it doesn't matter. We'll do it yeah, you time. can get him. We're, 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 we got to kill time till Dr. Mike shows up anyway. Okay, let me, um, yeah, let me just run. And maybe, uh, uh, City Soul Shine Growing can weigh in on this, on this controversial topic that we'll get to in a second. Everyone bear with us. So Dr. Mike had a, um, a Zoom meeting that kind of ended at two, so I just told him to jump on whenever he's done. Uh, yes, kill time. <laughs> we are gonna kill some time, but uh, Matt is gonna, I think, get his son to be our, our in-house musical. <laughs> Did you find him? Yeah, he's coming, he just uh, needs to change. Maybe you guys, I think we need a uh, father-son, <laughs> get your bathing suit and towel. What up, Lou? And, uh, so, all right, so our controversial topic was, you, what, what did, so we were talking Pearl Jam and sound, you said your son's really into Soundgarden, and then you made a statement. What was that oh, statement? Yeah. yeah, I was just remark because we're so into production now, and guitar tone and sound, because my son, built with me a lot of these guitars behind me and there's more laying about and guitar kits are a thing now and guitar pedals that you make like kit pedals and even just the printed circuit boards and you just get all the pieces from independent electrical like distributors and you build yourself so it's really like i mean all right so brian may made his guitar with his dad right and so we started that and he got really educated and he's developed my ear. And so I like go and listen and it's like, I hear elements that are unique to Soundgarden sound and production that I'm like, holy cow, like this could come out right now. And people would be like, oh my word, what is this? And I don't think that's the case with some of 10, you know, like, like the seminal album of each super unknown versus 10 in my mind. So that's just my opinion. You can agree, disagree, or agree with me. <laughs> We're talking about Super Unknown versus uh, Pro Jam 10. Ah, well, Super, Super Unknown, of course. But yeah. yeah. So should we jam? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, so I think you're, I, I disconnected you from the Echo. Okay. So only high tech audio here. We're uh, picking up your audio through the through your phone speakers. Yeah, and you know the iPods have gotten pretty good. I mean, let's do a sound check and see if it like translates. Yeah. Even if it doesn't sound that good, we'll take it. <laughs> we got an attenuator here, so we can dial it back if we need to. Yeah, so I am a self-taught musician, and I then like learned in school how to speak music theory, but then I refused to really teach my son, and then he became self-taught because I just exposed him continuously. So, yeah, do you want to play whatever? Or are you going to play something that we've played before? It doesn't matter. That's whatever. Yeah. Yeah.
We want to make sure that if Mike shows up, we can stop. <laughs> <laughs> right. I now I just I came back to make sure he hadn't. Uh, he's not like waiting on deck right now. But yeah, we just we just kind of get lost. We've been we've been playing together like his whole life on various instruments. So yeah. it's just. Uh, and how old are you now? Fourteen. All right. Yeah, he's way better than I. Like like it's crazy how farther along he is than I was when I, I was only a year into playing when I was 14. I mean, most of us, we didn't play guitar until we were a teenager, right? Right. Yeah, my dad told me my hands were too small, so I wasn't even allowed. There were guitars in the house. So wait, right, the, so, it, did, did you build that guitar? Yeah. This is actually the second guitar I built. Notice something about the guitar, no knobs. Yeah, because Strat seems so cramped because you have like, you know, these like three things and they're like right here and there's no like room to like actually like, you know, like strum and actually have Show them the style with the thing. So I like using the bar instead of going down like this. I like going up, it seems some natural motion. Instead of going like, it's counterintuitive. If you're strumming like this, going like this, it's like going like this is, feels right so you can go like you can just like have like the vibrato but without it just seems awkward to like stop and then go like this instead of just doing it while you're playing you know yeah so i'm talking about <laughs> excellent well thank you yeah, I mean, he educated me on so much, and I was a professional musician playing with Saturday Night Live's drummer for seven years in a band with all, like, hired guns. I was on TV. But it's this next generation, the internet. They're doing so... And, I mean, this is what, like, uh, uh, like this, this program is a byproduct of the internet, this possibility to these conversations. And I feel like the way people learn now is so different when they want to really learn people learn differently than they learn in school you know oh 100 percent. i mean i all i can ever imagine like in high school you know when you're at home there was no internet right so it's like anything you were learning you were kind of like by yourself with no access like now you can just be like i want to learn you know, let's say Ableton or Reason or whatever, like some specific thing with it. And, you know, you have immediate access to it and then other people too. So it's, uh, it'd be cool. Appreciate being 14 today. Yeah. Like when yeah. I was in high school and I wanted to find a friend, you just had to walk around the school looking for him. Whereas now you could just text him and be like, where the, where are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so much easier because it's like I was talking with Rostam. Like, you have to, like, it all, like, back then you had to get a record deal. You had to, like, know the right people to actually, like, record and get a nice sounding record. But now all I have to do is I literally just have a mic, I have a DAW, and then I just plug into the to Logic on, like, a laptop. And I get yeah. the same sound. And that analog to USB ease of conversion where you can be yeah. plugged in. Do you, do you have a. Um, a uh, hold on, an iRig. An iRig. What is that? It's basically you can run your guitar, um, or like uh, we, you know, straight straight into. Yeah. We have the Apollo. sorry sorry in, into your phone. I should say. Whoa, that's cool. So yeah. if you if you wanted to stream on like Instagram or something, dude, that's how I'm gonna do yeah. it. I'm gonna get thank you, room. thank you, show me that. Yeah, we have an Apollo for like nice recordings. So like, yeah, we learned Billy Eilish was rocking that, and our friend who run the studio down in L.A. My my best friend actually. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, we we 
His first record was with uh, me on bass, my best friend, like doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And then um, he just like added some like interesting guitar stuff to juxtapose his stuff. And um, and the uh, Mars Volt, the sax player. Yeah. Yeah. So that was his first song. We haven't even released it publicly yet. Yeah. But... It's like an EP. There's like, there's like the <laughs> Black Taxi and the Clarity, which are the instrumentals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like here. Yeah, the vinyl right there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know that you can print vinyl now? You can like private pressing vinyl and it's affordable ish. Yeah. Vinyl. All right, so this is. Open the, open the vinyl. Let him see. He chose clear vinyl. So, yeah, yeah. it's an EP. Yeah. You can kind of see that, you know, it's not the, not a full record. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of a punk record that you kept like, kept you like that. Like the Fugazi one? No, no, there was this band. I can't remember the band. Um, so, so for next week, you guys are going to have to figure out how to run. Like, I assume you can get both those. Like, do you have a, like a Mackie Twitter. board or anything? Uh-huh. Yeah, we have a Mackie yeah. board right there. Yeah. Do you understand? I love it. Yeah, so so you guys are gonna plug into the Mackie, and then and then what's do you have like a USB? Is it like a modern Mackie with a USB out, or is it a no. old school? No, but like but like they mixed Joss Stone on it. Um, back in the day, you know, it's. Yeah. Now I, well, I'm I'm focused on getting the the high quality audio into your computer. We got we just gotta we gotta get the eye rig. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that we can get order it pretty quick. Yeah. I mean, it's tiny. Come to the. It's gotta come to the. Remember class. that guy who was like had like his Rickham back, and then he had his like. All right. So we're back. gonna totally do this. This is brilliant. This is All brilliant. right. So for next week, we'll have you guys in high quality audio versus awesome. iPhone speaker audio. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Excellent. So should we play more or sit and discuss? Well, let's uh, let's let's uh, set the table for Doctor Mike since he may show up any second, right. and uh, kind of what what you want to be picking his brain about, and we can pull some thoughts from the peanut gallery of what people want to hear. Like I want to hear him talk about trichoderma and mycorrhizal fungi and their these are kits. We built these. This one I had, uh, this one I had to do twice. This one I made one mistake and I had to fix it. But <laughs> do you like crazy. that? We can all learn to do anything now. Can, can you see that on the screen? Play songs about fungi. <laughs> Good. So how about uh, is it James? Yeah, James. Uh, you're gonna come back in an hour with a song about. Fungi. Okay, I'll write a song about fungi. You know, he was trained to cultivate mushrooms by Peter McCoy, the author of Radical Mycology himself. So, yeah, your assignment is ahead of you. Okay. <laughs> well, well, and, and you're going to play it for Dr. Mike, who knows a thing or two about fungi. Mycorrhizal man. Okay. <laughs> that could be the name of the song. Mycorrhizal man, please listen. You don't know what you're missing. The world is at your command. All right, he'll be back. Yeah, thank you so much. That, that made my day, that made his day, and hopefully some people enjoyed that. And we'll get the sound quality up. And yeah, I had to be like careful like when I was starting because I didn't know what we were in. <laughs> Yeah, you you see that one up on the screen. Endophytic relationships versus mycorrhizal relationships. Yes, yes. Part two. Yeah. So so that's exactly what I'm interested in as well. We're all kind of on the same page, right? We're we're kind of all reading the same stuff. And if you've read my book, anyone out there, um, you know that I see all these things moving together. So I'm really keen on answer, asking a few different questions. First of all, I just want to get him to like encapsulate, you know, his perspective on how things have changed. 
um, over the past 40 years, instead of, you know, just talking about the benefits of fungi, um, I want to like dive right into like, uh, you know, some people say endomycorrhizae are all are vascular, what some say, you know, majority of endomycorrhizal are, um, so I want to know which ones are not are muscular that are endomycorrhizae and why there's that confusion. And is it a language thing? Because so much of this is categorical language that has changed a few different times. And I just want to talk to him about a few different things like the glomericota, like the rhizophagus, intraradices. Where did glomus go? Is it because of genetic testing or is it because of the rhizophagy cycle discovery? Uh, I just was wondering about if you knew any details on, on that, because I'm sure, right? I'm sure he's got some thoughts on that. Because that, for me, reveals a, like a scientific revision that we're all kind of agreeing to, and it's implicit rather than like written down anywhere. And then the whole idea that like mycorrhizal fungi bringing the phosphorus, I want to know ah. how much le leakage. The, and there he is. Dr. Mike. Hey, Hello. how are you? I'm wonderful. How are, are you? I'm doing well. He he was just setting the table with some of the things he wanted to pick your brain about. So now he doesn't have to repeat himself all over again. We have a whole bunch of audience questions ready to go. So welcome. Yeah. How, how is Hawaii? Oh, it was good. It was a good place to be during COVID. Obviously, you can be outside. And, yeah. And they've done a great job controlling it over there. So yeah. Uh, it was very lovely. It was we we're very happy to have that opportunity for especially for seven weeks. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's good. Could be home though. Springtime is beautiful here, and it's also a place that needs mycorrhizal uh, knowledge. And, and right, I'm sure you help some people. I can I can do a podcast from Hawaii too. Yeah. <laughs> so they're not mutually exclusive. Absolutely. So Gotham didn't send out the mycorrhizal signal and you came running back from Hawaii to save the day? Actually, I have a little lab here, so I did really miss doing the lab work. I have a little lab in my home and I miss just kind of messing around with the fungi and growing different strains and looking at results. And so I, I did miss the science part of it. I mean, you can read, but it's not like doing hands-on work. Absolutely. All right. Well, it is an absolute pleasure to be talking to you, Mike. I am a huge fan and I'm also uh, like a huge fan of your work as I've seen it like quoted and referenced by people like Michael Phillips and other authors as I've done my own studying and, and, uh, and learning. And I, I have some, some, I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> And, and a lot of it's about like the changes um, over time about a lot of these things. Some of them new discoveries, some of them like sort of like revisions with categories and names. And from your perspective, it would just be fascinating to, to hear your reactions and your perspective on some of these things. Okay. Because it's not like someone's out there with like uh, a website explaining why glomus changed to rhizophagus. So, I would I would love to just start with just general. How has you know mycorrhizae and its uh, and, and 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 how has that perspective you know changed over the last forty years uh, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's when when I started back in 1976, there wasn't a lot of people doing mycorrhizal research, and so you can kind of keep up with you know, what somebody was doing in the UK or somebody was doing in Australia or somebody was doing in Asia because there was just a few scientists doing that. And and since in the last, especially in the last 10 years, there's been a lot more interest and a lot more research activity. There's over 100,000 papers on mycorrhizae. It's just impossible to, to keep up with with the literature. But I think it's what's the good thing that's happened is mycorrhiza has come out of obscurity it's really um you know the general public has a much better appreciation for fungi in general especially for plant fungal relationships and what it can do for plant growth and in an environmentally based plant growth so those are all improvements in the last 10 years i think 
there's been more a technology transfer, just just better, you know, layman's terms of mycorrhiza. In the old days, it was a bunch of old scientists, you know, talking to each other with a lot of jargon and a lot of technical terms. So it was really hard hard for the layperson to understand what was going on. It was hard for us scientists to understand what was going on. So um, it's it's generally improved, and a lot of it is like you know shows like Peter's, you know, where you've got you know, people asking, you know, real world questions about their real world, you know, issues about their soil and their plants and their growing conditions and how mycorrhizae may or may not be, you know, part of that. So it's crazy. I mean, it's been a fun ride for me. I we started out as a researcher and I just started dabbling. I was growing mycorrhizae just as um, because I needed it for my own experiments. And I realized that after, you know, 20 years of growing my own mycorrhiza for experiments that I, I really enjoyed doing it um, and understanding it um, and how to apply it. And those were things that people were kept asking questions about. And so we formed our own company um, and we became the world's largest producer of mycorrhizal inoculum. And that was sold the company five years ago. And I'm still, you know, reading about mycorrhizae every day, and it's just nice not to have the the pressure of, you know, having a big company to run and you know, gobs of employees, and and so this has been a lot more comfortable for me just to read about mycorrhizae and enjoy and enjoy it without having, to, you know, be constantly bombarded with you know issues about regulation and registration and you know, all those things that go with, you know, growing. So it's been good that you talked about um, the taxonomy and then I'll be quiet and let you start answering your questions. But <laughs> the taxonomy stuff has been really, um, has been really interesting to follow. Um, there are real, there are a lot of rules about nomenclature. Mm. And um, some of those rules pertain to the first collection. So the first collections, if you describe that species, and it's the first collection, that's the type collection. And that becomes the first order of the name. Well, as they start digging into a lot of this material, they realize there wasn't any material left from those first collections. So nobody was quite sure of, no one was quite sure of that original collection, if it really was the same as this one that somebody found in Siberia or Alaska or Costa Rica. You know, is it really the same species? Because they're, the first collection is gone to compare it oh, to. Of this is incredible. So, so it really got, it's, it's been a mess. And the DNA uh, material, now that they can, uh, you know, look at the ITS region, which is the region of the fungal, of the fungal DNA that holds the differences between mycorrhizae, it's, this, it's called this ITS region. Well, there's some variation in this ITS, ITS region, even within a species. So at what point is that so much variation that, of the DNA that you would call it a separate species? So there's all kinds of interpretive things. People think, well, yeah, this is an alligator or a crocodile. You know, they're two different species. But when it comes to fungi, there's everything in between. That, and you have to decide, you know, what you base it on. And Historically, it was based on, you know, macroscopic uh, features or microscopic features like the color of the mushroom and the way it stained and, you know, the way the gills were arranged or the way the stem was arranged or for the endomycorrhiza, which are the big ones for the hemp and marijuana industries, you know, a lot of those, those endos were based on the spore size, the spore which is the seed of the mycorrhiza or the shape of it or the amount of layers in the in the wall of the spore um so it's based on that but then the dna <laughs> different. so then what do you do so i have you know, questions it, it's a mess out there in the taxonomic world yeah so going back to amf so i know amf um absorbs the nuclei of other other phyla um and Am I correct that it's other species as well? And in their spores, they can trigger these like cascades of change because they can source DNA that's in their library that will cue the next phase in succession 
or reaction to the climate or or or, 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 or soil. That's correct. So then it really gets confusing. And you know, so what is it? What is a species? You know, <laughs> everything's sort of moving around. It's funny because the the endomycorrhizae are constantly changing, but they look almost identical as they did 460 million years ago. So there's all this interchange, but and fusion of nuclei. But I mean, basically, the endomycorrhizal taxonomy, I mean, the, the anatomy of how these things work hasn't changed in 460 million years, so. Well, I, I tend to think of it as a musician would, because that's actually what I started out as, bizarrely enough. But I think of it as an analog uh, modulating keyboard. Like, you know how you can create like an ever-changing sound on an analog keyboard? And you're like, oh, well, this makes it so that it's always just gonna keep making this ever-changing sound. And it's like, maybe there's like, it's like almost like there's a like the a rusty mycorrhizal uh, 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 fungi is like a premise and it creates that um, that yeah. that variation. I like the sound part of the analogy because they're finding that these AMF, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, actually communicate between themselves and between plants. So there's these linkages, this whole network idea where. You know, one plant would warn another plant of a impeding aphid attack um, because via these linked mycorrhizal hyphae, which is fascinating. Um, and there's all kinds of literature now about the network and how the network does communicate and how plants do talk to each other and how fungi are actually communicating and how they're exploring in the soil. And all these, these, like you say, these genomes that lay buried inside the fungus that only manifest themselves when needed, like the ability of mycorrhizal fungi to detoxify soils. I mean, they're, they're using them in Chernobyl. They're using white black fungi in Chernobyl there to detoxify their soils. I mean, it's just crazy what's going on. It's just the fifth kingdom is really pretty unique and really poorly understood. I, I agree. Speaking of, Glamas intraradices became rhizophagous intraradices. Is that because of the rhizophagy cycle? Well, it, or maybe it's Glamas, rhizoglomus, which is another genus that's being proposed for that group. So, you know. It's amazing. It's a lot of it. I mean, the rhizophagous thing makes it sound like a pathogen. I think a lot of people don't like that because it makes it sound like a pathogen, which it's not symbiotic beneficial symbiont. So a lot of people don't like that one. I mean, um, Glomus was the historical group um, that all these things were, you know, Jim Trappy, who I'm good friends with, uh, described some of the first Glomus species at Oregon State University. I'm actually going to see Jim in a couple of weeks. He's 93. Wow. Great old guy. But, you know, they, Lomas is just, just a name that they thought up for all this stuff. You know, it doesn't, there's no magic to it, you know, and there is in the Glomales, is the group that it's under. And so they called it Glomus. But uh, I mean, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what, what you call it, as long as everybody agrees of what's distinctive about that particular group. So I like Rhizoglomus because it is, you know, the rhizo is the root uh, and glomus is the historical thing. So it kind of brings things together. But are you familiar with Dr. James White's work on rhizophagy? No. Oh, it's it's brand new. So it's really wild. He developed a stain that allows for the endophytes to appear only because they show up against the backdrop that he creates. They're like yeah. basically invisible, but they get taken in through the meristem cells of the growing root tip. And then they're attacked with, uh, well, they're bombarded with superoxidase, um, reactive oxygen, and then they're releasing electrolytes, other nutrients. Sometimes they're even destroyed. But what happens is they are actually used to elongate uh, the root hairs. And then they can even escape and be squeezed out of the root hair tips and where the exudation is there as well and then reconstitute their cell walls. 
the stain for the exudates or is it a stain for the fungal material? That's what it's, I, it's a stain um, for the slide uh, so they can see it, um, so that they can see the microbes going into the, 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 the root, the growing root tip. Oh, interesting. Um, He's at Rutgers. Historically, we used a blue stain. It was tripan blue, which because the fungal part of the root, the mycorrhiza of the fungus root, between, because the fungal part is made out of chitin, the blue stain would highlight the chitin in the fungus so you could separate out from the cellulose part of the root system. So we, and I still use, that's the blue stain that I use is actually Indian ink with vinegar, basically. The blue from the Indian ink gets into the fungus and that's how we count it and observe it and all the rest of that stuff. So that's fascinating that they're coming up with new ways to be able to follow the material. I mean, there's been some really interesting work with, you know, other chemicals to try and figure out, you know, how the mycorrhizae are actually working in the soil as well. So that's new to me. Thank you. Oh, no problem. It was brand new to me. And I was thinking about, I was trying to figure out, uh, I mean, obviously the electrolytes, you know, they are, you know, are mostly, you know, H and O and C and there's a, sometimes N and sometimes S, but there's mostly no phosphorus. And mm -hmm. so thinking about phosphorus uptake, um, it's like yeasts can carry that and some of these endophytic yeasts, you know, um, like like even baker's yeast is, is, is endophytic. Um, they can carry some portion of that, but I, I was wondering if you had had done any uh, or heard of any anyone trying to even look at that. Um, because I know that so many people are trying to load up their microbes with nutrients and then put them into the soil profile. And if it, and if we could figure out, and then if we could figure out how to load them properly and unload them properly. Uh, I think that that's the, the key at this point, because we know that we can load them up and then we know that they're, you know, there are different processes, the soil food web, the rhizophagy cycle, mycorrhizal, um, and then even just the exchange of the protons. Um, so I'm super interested in all this. Um, so something I was, because your work focused on phosphorus and uh, external digestion, I was really interested to know if there's a trickle down effect when just like with the lion attacking the animal and then the carcass feeds all the microbes and other animals at the tropic levels and does that happen when fungi have these external digestions with these enzymatic digestion of, of phosphorus with other other things flying around that's that's a really good question and i think what happens is that the mycorrhiza are probably keystone species for the unlocking of phosphorus in the soil. So there's, they produce uh, phosphatase in yeah. huge amounts. And they basically, what they're able to do is they actually will explore in every direction. But once they find a pool of phosphorus, they're able to pool their resources and all their growing into that pool. So even though like if you've ever seen like in a Petri dish, you got a culture and the culture grows radial in all directions. Well, the mycorrhiza does that at the beginning and then when it'll find a pool of phosphorus in whatever form, it organic or inorganic, it'll produce that phosphatase and it'll take all the other energy that it's using from growing the other directions and it'll allocate that to where the pool of phosphorus is. And you're right. I mean, the other organisms are benefiting from the digestion of that phosphorus so it's released it's absorbed pretty quickly with the by the mycorrhiza but if you look closely there's always like um huge colonies of bacteria growing i think we wait bacteria my, growing on sorry mike can you start that comment over i think we lost you Okay, I think I had a call coming in, sorry. All right, am I back? Yeah, you are. I, I, I don't wanna miss it because I think everyone's hanging on your every word right now and suddenly oh, it was are. like mute. So, so take I, it about three sentences back. So the mycorrhiza are, they allocate their resources, they grow all these tremendous amount of mycelium, 
where the pools of phosphorus are. So to do that, they have to pull resources from other parts of the soil. And then they produce this phosphatase enzyme, which is specific for phosphorus, that digests the phosphorus in both organic and inorganic forms. So as they're doing that, the phosphorus is basically released. And even though the mycorrhizae are right there, you know, next to where the phosphorus is being released, um, other organisms benefit. And if you look at, if you really look at a compound microscope of any mycelial strand, it's just coated with bacteria. I mean, they're just, like you say, it's like, it's like being in an ocean and some, you know, a shark will be tearing something apart and there's just food everywhere. And, you know, the ocean has these little fish that actually are eating it at the same time. So um, there is a release of phosphorus and I think it probably benefits you know, a lot of different organisms in the soil. So, but the, uh, the really unique part of that about mycorrhiza is that it's multicellular. So it has puts together these long filaments. And so it can not only release the phosphorus, but then it's the transport system back to the, directly into the plant root. So once it's in that, once it's in that mycelial strand, there's ways that it pumps itself back into the root. So it's like the super highway for the movement of that. And in those cases, it's not available to other organisms. However, the mycorrhizae don't last forever. So every couple of weeks, that's gonna break down and die. And then that's going to be released to, these, to the bacteria and other organisms in the soil. So because these things are constantly turning over, you know, then they become available for the next trophic level of organisms in the soil. That is awesome. That is awesome. So, um, have you have you seen how folks are now talking about soil redox, like the millivolts of the soil? I, you know, frankly, I don't understand all that. <laughs> I've never really gotten into it. I mean, I mean, there's energy fields obviously in the soil. But I'm well, never, yeah. Well, the flip side of it is what they're going for is oxidation. I mean, because you know, there's three different. There's at least three different definitions for oxidation. So, in specific for this, we're pairing, which is the common definition that most people know. Uh, ox when you're gaining oxygen, you're losing an electron, and because of that, um, there's all these. There's so many implications. So, we'll skip that. But, but yeah, I mean, when you mentioned like adding too much phosphorus, you're oxidizing the soil, like, or uh, fertilizer when you're uh, in, a, in a different presentation. Um, that's, that's, that's the idea is that it's oxidation versus reduction. And the reduction is the energy or water because it could be protons, right? It could be, you know, just really waterlogged soil. Um, but then if it gets too waterlogged, it flips. I know it's crazy. Um, so let's go to the next one. <laughs> it's another wormhole. Um, the soil redox thing is wild because A, it's hard for people to test. And then B, it, it's, its implications are like pandemic. Um, but we're not going to get into that. I want to ask about Bahia grass. Like the, the bagged Bahia grass method for cultivating AMF. I'm familiar with that. That's like the classical one. People can find it everywhere. Um, what are the drawbacks of that? And what are some other ways that, you, that you've that you seen or you, that you pioneered, you know? <laughs> I mean, there's, I mean, the beauty of these C4 grasses is that they do fix a lot of photosynthate and they make it available to the root system. So you know, that carbon that the mycorrhiza need for their own I and mean, those sugars are the mycorrhizas food. So you're providing an ample food supply for the for the plants. Um, and so, I mean, soil inoculum and mycorrhizal inoculum and soil transfer of that inoculum have been around since probably for hundreds of years. I mean, when people were even in even in Europe, you know, people were moving soils from productive areas to non-productive areas. I know in like some of the early truffle stuff too, they would take soil from truffle trees that were producing truffles 
and they would move them to other my, my grandfather did that in italy back in wow. early 1900s he was packing soil from one trees that were producing truffles to oak trees that weren't producing truffles trying to get more things so soil transfer has been around for a long time which is kind of which is basically the you know what you're doing with this inoculant production you're producing fresh live you know mycorrhizal inoculum growing vigorously in a container where you're controlling all the inputs uh, to increase the amount of mycorrhizal activity and you're taking it from there and then in the next year you're using it you know next to another plant and so there's a lot of propagules in that really the best propagules are are root fragments because they are actually inside those tiny little fine root fragments you've got all of this mycelium you've got arbuscules you've got vesicles you've got all this stuff so and they tend to germinate faster than the spores because the spores have a higher level of dormancy than the than the root fragments so i mean i think the best inoculum has a combination of both wow uh, both roots and spores but in terms of quick and i think the literature shows this if you want quick mycorrhiza you want um you know fine roots that are actively colonized by mycorrhiza are the most easy to germinate and you form mycorrhiza the quickest but I, i'm a firm firm believer and you know and that's a really low cost way it's feeding a lot of people all over the world i know um there's probably you know 10 million pounds of that material being commercially sold and there's probably a lot being produced i know a lot of local farms in africa produce their own i know a lot of growers produce their own and it's 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 a lot of work to do it right and you have to make sure you've got oxygen which is the big problem if it gets too wet then you get pathogens associated with with you know poor drainage and then you're introducing that into your your yeah, soil sure. which is not good so i mean you got to make sure that it's pathogen free but it's pretty pretty effective and pretty low cost are you doing the are, are you doing things like making sure the soil is like phosphorus like 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 uh not depleted but um just not rich in phosphorus so that the plants like so that they really boom yeah, or i mean are you, are you yeah. maybe adding some antagonistic element that is opposite that on that you know that wheel <laughs> And make right. it so that it's even inhibited, and so it does even more, or is, or is that too much? No, at high level, at, well, you got to be careful when you start tweaking too many things, because then everything goes crazy. But um, <laughs> obviously, obviously, too much phosphorus is not good for mycorrhizal activity, and it's not the total phosphorus; it's available phosphorus. So it really depends on how your how much your soil material actually absorbs the phosphorus. So it's more the anion exchange capacity which is sort of a measure of how tightly phosphorus is held um on the whatever the soil particle surface is right so you want you want you want soils that have ha high anion exchange capacity and you don't want a lot of available phosphorus um but actually you get better mycorrhizal colonization at moderate levels of phosphorus than you do at super low levels because the moderate levels encourage more root growth, which creates more energy for the mycorrhizal activity. That's so really good. There's you know. a medium there, you know, and a lot of that was just discovered through trial and error. Yeah, that's really, really good to know. I know that there's probably several people who are <laughs> had that as a question. So, so what do you think about all these? Um, because there's like binders, alginates, clays, and mediums for storage and delivery of microbes. Like what methods do you prefer to use um, as delivery aids? Because I know that everything has an effect, right? Um, what's the most gentle? <laughs> I think, you know, organic carbon sources are really good ways to get mycorrhiza to your plants. Um, they tend to be sort of habitat for the hyphae and stuff as they come out. And the organic inputs, you know, feed the whole microbial complex. So you get, you get like blooms of all kinds of positive um, organisms that influence your soil. So, and putting carbon in soil is something we should be doing as a species because we got too much in the atmosphere. 
and we need to put it back in the soil where it used to be before we started, you know, intensive agriculture. So, and fossil fuel, you know, utilization for automobiles and transportation and everything else. So any opportunity we can to put carbon in the soils through compost, you know, biochar, worm casting. I mean, that's, that's all the mycorrhizae love it for one thing. Yeah. They know just what to do with it. So, um, how do you feel about the metric measurements for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things versus the biological? Because like we just talked about, like the millivolts, that's constantly changing. Like there's so many factors to it. It's very interesting. It's very insightful, but again, it's like all over the map because the microbes control these things. And so what, and, and then, and then what, what testing methods do you like to use uh, for, for growers and growing operations? Well, a colonization test is low cost and it actually tells you, you know, the plants, the level of colonization, which is, I think, important. However, you know, just for your, your viewers and your listeners, um, the, you don't need to get a hundred. I didn't get that one. <laughs> he got a phone call. And he's back. Okay. Hey. Phone call is coming in. Sorry about that. Um, so what you want to do from terms of a mycorrhizal colonization test is you basically clear the roots uh, of the tannins and then you put the stain on the roots and the stain and then you look at the percentage of that root system that's colonized. And it, once you get up to about 30% colonization, you know, you're golden. You're getting all the benefits of the mycorrhizal relationship. If you're down below 5%, you, you're you going to greatly benefit by having more mycorrhiza, more colonization. So it's a simple test. You don't need a lot of uh, expensive chemicals. Um, you need like a ventilation hood. You need potassium hydroxide. That's what you used to clear the roots. And you need Indian ink to stain the roots after you're done. So, and then a Petri dish and a dissecting microscope to look at the blue, the blue portions of the root. So a dissecting microscope, um, what the low power one that's up to 30 power, actually 40 power is better. Um, yeah. but you need at least 30 power to do it, but 40 power works really good for looking at mycorrhiza. Okay. I need to get some of that. When you think about it, that's not, that powerful microscope you could probably get them on the internet for less than 200 bucks yeah you need, a, you need a good light you need a good light um to light the microscope so you know i recommend uh well i'll show you what what i look like here got you know i've just got a dissecting microscope and a compound microscope uh, can you see that okay? Yeah. So it's so a Leica, uh, and then the, my, uh, it's called, it's an AM scope. So it's just got the, uh, these pinpointing lighting things that you can really turn on really high uh, and really observe the. That is different from mine. Yeah. Mine it's just is more really, like the other one. Here's my uh, morel door. That's beautiful. <laughs> and my spore clock. Yeah. And, my, and my spore stuff. And my mushroom wall. Oh, man. I love it. I love it. I'm having a good time with this stuff. Yeah. we. You know, <laughs> it's funny. I was a musician. And my wife got cancer. And then I needed to be home more. And I became a public school teacher. And then I wrote a book. And and then I've written 20 books since. And I've just been on this this deep dive on uh, on, on science and, and, and soil. And, and speaking of deep dives, have you seen the 3D microscop uh, microscopy uh, like new images that are coming out? They're having living and dead cells in 3D that they're they're visualizing. That's yeah, I can 
Yeah, that's what you don't realize is that when you look on the microscope, you're really seeing, unless you focus up and down, you're not really seeing things in three dimensional. And a lot of the electron microscopy work is more three dimensional and it really makes it cool to look at. Yeah, I I long to I long to like do that. I mean, what was it like? Does it feel like? Because I think about this all the time. I feel like there, it's like a big room, and we're still exploring it. What does it feel like to explore through an electron uh, 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 electron microscope? Well, it's hard to do, and you can't have anybody bouncing around. So you got to do it on a really. Uh, <laughs> Any kind of vibration is totally messes it up. But um, so they, they build special rooms for them. So there's not any bouncing going on. So if you're part of a big lab, even somebody walking down the hallway, you know, hundred feet away affects the quality of the picture. Um, so yeah, they put these things to stabilize the room within the microscope. So um, it's great. It takes a lot of time, but you learn so much about, you know, how these things look. Um, because they are three dimensional and because of the magnitude of, I mean, I've, and people love looking at, it. I think people have a better appreciation for the organisms too, when they see how beautiful they are in magnified. Does it seem like it's like, I, I kind of think of it as like, like an ocean. Is that, is that appropriate? Uh, or like the universe, let's do yeah. I mean, that's what Leonardo da Vinci said. It was like, we know more about the, the universe that we know about the soil universe beneath our feet. So, um, yeah, I kind of think of like exploring space out there because there's a lot of voids out there too. So, yeah, it's we probably know five percent of what <laughs> years. So, but so you know, I, a lot of a lot of good has already occurred. I mean, I can tell you a lot of restoration projects that have benefited from reestablishing mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza do not like fallow conditions. So they don't like certain kinds of plants like cheatgrass, which occupies a lot of the Western US. They don't like, um, you know, fallow periods where there's no plant host on the site because that's their energy source. So they, they don't like that at all. Um, they don't like intensive tillage, it just, they don't have um, septa, the endomycorrhiza don't have cell walls between these strands. So when you break it up, all of the cytoplasm blows out of them. So they die pretty quickly when they're tilled. So they really don't like tillage. I mean, minimum till is fine. I mean, because you have to leave enough strands intact where it recolonizes the area. But I mean, those are things. And there's certain weeds, like the worst weed, um, when it comes to mycorrhizae is amaranthus, which is my last name. So I'm the world's worst non-mycorrhizal host plant. It's a super weed and it's non-mycorrhizal. So I have to live with the pain of that on a daily basis. That, well, you know, I only realized recently that all those non-mycorrhizal plants, they, part of the reason why, well, this is likely, I, I've got to see it done more like thoroughly, but I suspect that because they don't have a mycorrhizal filter, these non-mycorrhizal plants don't have the defense systems and their uptake. So this is why like we're seeing like, oh, there's there's nitrates in the in the brassicas. Oh, there's E. coli, you know, like there's all these problems because these plants don't have this ability to filter like all these, uh, and, and especially established plants like perennials that have this deeper relationship and longer lasting relationship they can really filter what do you think about that <laughs> absolutely in fact i it's it's true i mean like the re, how mycorrhizae tolerate salty soils is that the filaments actually the you know, mycorrhizal threads are actually absorbing the salt to super toxic levels and they break it off and they never bring it back to the plant so they sort of take take one for the plant they uh, commit hairy carry out there in the soil. They absorb the salt and they break it off before <clears> they ever bring it back to the plant. So yeah, they're selective. They're they're out there, you know, sort of making decisions. We we have a plant centric uh, view of the world where we think the plant is calling all the shots. When I would contend that maybe it's the fungus in many cases is actually 
making resource allocation decisions on water and where the phosphorus goes and and those kinds of things because they're actually out there in the soil like doing that the exploration for the plant's benefit do you feel that that fungi were the first plants uh like the first trees to be specific and then the tree you know what i mean that you have you've heard this whole micro progression yeah epigenesis? yeah i mean they, they're pretty much most scientists agree that the first life on the planet was was fungi uh, and a billion years ago, and they produce these tall, weird, phallic looking structures that they have these um, fossil records of. And so um, just in the terms of the history of of plants and fungi, um, most scientists agree it was about 460 million years ago when these primitive algae had floating around in these inland seas uh, were able to colonize their surface by using the relationship with these primitive fungi. So it was the evolutionary leap, leap that led to plants on Earth was the uh, the marriage of primitive plants with these decomposing fungi, these foraging fungi. And that relationship became the mycorrhizal relationship. But the earliest plants had didn't have roots. They were just floating mats of algae basically so that evolutionary leap you know led to the colonization of the earth's surface it's interesting to note that back then the whole carboniferous period um, where all of our oil comes from and all our coal comes from that carboniferous period some people have argued was a result that you had suddenly you had plants on the land but you didn't have anything to decompose the plants. So you didn't have white rot fungi. And because you didn't have these, there was no fungi to decompose lignin, that all of this organic matter that the plants are producing just accumulated. And then that eventually became the, the, the coal and oil that they searched for during the Carboniferous period. So you could actually argue the lack of fungi led to, you know, the oil and coal deposits that we have today. I mean, pretty crazy to think about all this stuff yeah i mean i love thinking about it all i feel like it helps me understand the world i live in now like like the why behind i mean you've heard probably of fourth phase water um and yeah th this this concept of uh, of of uh water that's in a gel state and on the roots it forms this gel state and that's also the space where they're uh, ex uh they're releasing protons and there's this argument uh well there's people on all sides of all these things but but the idea is that that this fourth phase water is the reason that it, it can conduct like that in many ways um so efficiently and plants develop that because that's the nature of water. And so because things have a nature, it allows me to see the world from more of a first principle space and allows me to understand things better, or at least think I do. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, you know, your initial question was, you know, how do you deliver mycorrhizae? And the key is not so much, you know, the carrier, but the, how close you get it to the root system. To mm. an active root system. I mean, in my experience, the closer you get it to an active root system, the more effective it's going to be, and the quicker you're going to see the benefits. So, um, you want to get it near roots. I mean, you wouldn't want to spread mycorrhizal on top of the soil where there aren't no root, where there isn't any root activity. Um, and you want it to, if you do apply it, you can't apply it by watering it in if it's in suspension, if your soils are porous enough. So, I mean, you can you can water it in definitely if your soils are porous, but I mean, you don't want to leave it on the surface of the soil. It's just going to bake in the sun. After so while. speaking to that, the, the, the speaking to that, do you, a lot of people are into transplanting. Do you prefer to plant from seed in inoculated soils once knowing that the soil profile has inoculant in it, like, like throughout so that it could, as those growing root tips go out, it's meeting more mycorrhizae inoculant or are, are you more into like the cup up method, right? Where you're like going sizing up and then inoculating those outer edges every single time. Cause I know people do both. Hmm. 
It's good. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think, I think both would work. I'm not sure which one is better. Your growers probably know more than I do about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then what what would you say the best um, and, uh, endomycorrhizal partnerships are specifically for cannabis since this is the future cannabis um, project? Uh, is Would it be like the standard four um, or, 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 or are there more now that you, you would add in or specific from that group that you would add in for cannabis? I, well, I think, you know, the, there's been research on the four, so we know they work. Um, there are some probably going to be some other species that are identified that are specific to a function. Yeah, uh, I've got, yeah. There might be better that are better phosphorus solubilizers or better pathogen protection or better for you know flowering or what or whatever the whatever the right like desertacola right for, for for dry conditions very much so and uh that's actually a good one that's now being mass produced so um yeah especially if you had you know periods of drought um i'm in california <laughs> right, right. No, that, that could be a good one. And I th I've never seen a specific test for that. It's been isolated for the cannabis, but I've seen lots of tests where it's been isolated for other, like tomatoes, uh, marigolds. I've seen deserticola on trees. Um, so, yeah, it, it's uh, it's a good one. Glomus tuticanum is pretty good for low moisture conditions as well. Um, and it's uh, super hardy, so it could handle a lot of adverse conditions as well i think so so what's your opinion about uh the claroidio glomus atunicatum like that renaming thing again because because i'm i think it's the same thing i think it's the same fungus so, so it, it's 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 wild because i'm like looking at like rhodobacter like spheroides and i'm like are you like <laughs> you know what i mean because it's like people are doing the same microbe with different names but then as we have learned that these microbes are also these just libraries of information and, like and an ability yeah it's like a treasure map trying to figure out what is what it's just crazy um even for me you know and i've been around for a long time but the thing is, is a lot of them are changing i got a friend i got a feeling they're going to change again so i almost don't want to learn the next name until you know, there's still controversy over whether or not that name is gonna uh, update. I would, I would say, as a as a grower, yeah. Um, if you talk to a manufacturer, ask for specific documentation of studies or trials that included that fungus and demonstrated, you know, some of the functional benefits that the grower is looking for. So, I mean, a good manufacturer will have tons of data. I know the company that, you know, I sold to, they spend, you know, two to $4 million a year on research where they test, they've got, they've actually got a mycorrhizal spore bank from the University of West Virginia. <coughs> so they're constantly testing those species for different applications, not only different crops, but different kinds of soil climatic environments. So I mean, they're investing a lot of money to see what what's performing and what's not performing. If your guys can't, if your manufacturer can't, you know, come up with any supporting documentation, <laughs> I think go somewhere else. So, I mean, Absolutely. So, and, and obviously, your your listeners are pretty good about you know asking questions and doing the technical part. I can tell you though, I I have seen. You know, if, especially if the phosphorus level is moderate or below, so many experiments over the last 40 years that, you know, the plants were healthier. And I ended up with less problems over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm obviously a big part of mycorrhiza, but I think a lot of things that people don't realize is that a lot of your other problems go away. Uh, problems with, with root diseases go away. Problems with um, nitrogen um uptake goes away problems with iron nutrition go away and um, if you ever saw um, phosphorus as a as a as it is in the soil it's like a little rock you should look at a little p p like 
calcium phosphate, it looks just like a little rock. There's no way that's getting into a root. And that's what the mycorrhiza does. It takes these little rocks and it dissolves them to make to make them available. Because you know, it's not at, in as an insoluble calcium phosphate, it's not going anywhere. And to override that, you can add soluble phosphorus, but that's a lot of cases that does more damage uh, over the long term than these, you know, the natural process of absorbing phosphorus because you you get a lot of other things growing that you don't want to have growing. Same with nitrogen. Have you seen any of the research on microbacteria um, that are like inside some of the uh, some of the mycorrhizae? I had some friends send me some pictures of these these microfilms, these films both on the surface and then actually inside. Um, it's fascinating. They're there. Nobody's quite sure what they're doing, but um, you know, maybe they they have some important function in there as well. But um, they may be just using the mycorrhiza as a super highway to get because it takes a long time for a bacteria to you know to get from one place to another, and they could be just using the mycorrhizal system as transport. And you know, it could be the transport system. I mean, I've seen some theories on that too. And they could, the mycorrhizae might even be able to select for the end of fights. And that's, you know what I mean? And, and hand, basically hand select, you know, the right ones for that plant. It'd be so fascinating to figure that out. It's coming. There's a lot of people working on it. And a lot of the best research is actually being done places like India. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they really invested a lot. They, the Indian people, um, they have really small farms and they're still using largely organic methods. And um, a lot of the research institutions in India are top notch. So they're really some, getting some good inputs on, on that, that whole Terry, I don't know if you know, Terry, the energy resource Institute, they do, they've got like 15 PhDs working on mycorrhizae. And so they're investigating a lot of this stuff. They're, they're a good group. They put out some great research, but a lot of it's, you know, organic, using organic methods. It's been a tougher, tougher sell in North America where you've got, a, you know, higher percentage of larger farms that are more conventional and, you know, business as usual. Well, I have great hope um, because your work has paved, well, you basically created a doorway that everyone's walking through now. And I mean, we're talking about details, like on a, like like a uh, entire you know series of paradigms that you've really helped uh, spread, so that we could actually know what the fundamental pathways for health are that plants have. I've had a lot of I've had a lot of fun doing it, and I've had a lot of help doing it too. I've worked with some great scientists over the years that. You know, it's, it's a lot of this has been serendipity too. When we, you know, you find a fungus or you find a condition or you, you know, you just you got lucky. You know, you're having a beer with some guy in the UK and he talks about something that he saw in the field and like, you know, it's been interesting and there's still a lot more to be done. But um, the more we talk, the better the better we get. You know, it's bizarre in in some ways because. It, it's this, we, we look through these microscopes and everything, we try to construct, well, I try to construct these visuals to understand it. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's so interesting. There's something deeply compelling about it. And I wonder on one, in one way, if it's like we're staring at the missing components of our, our, our bodies, like like so many of our, our gut biomes, there's this overlap, like lactic acid bacteria, you know, there's an overlap of health between um, certain modalities. You have more microbiological bacterial cells in your body than you have human cells. So, I mean, you could argue that you're as much as a symbiont as a plant root system in that, you know, that's what's regulating your body, digesting your food. Uh, human cells aren't doing it. It's the microbial cells that are doing it. And so, 
you know, we're, we're symbionts just like our plant friends. Yeah, I recently heard that the microbes that are in our guts actually also migrate up to our brain. And I haven't seen a paper on it yet. I heard an expert on another, another show talking about it. But it makes, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, the more we study these plants, the more we're like, oh, well, there's endophytic fungi throughout all these plants, you know? And it's like, oh, we are fungal beings in a way, because if you take the fungi out of the body, we die. <laughs> there's, there's a great book called Entangled Life. Um, it's written by, uh, what is, uh, it'll come to me the author's name, but... Um, Merlin Sheldrake is his name, um, and it's Entangled Life, and it's about, here's a great chapter on mycorrhiza, but it talks about, you know, beer making, bread making, cheese making, done by yeast. It talks about, you know, the evolution of fungi. It talks about fungi as medicine. Mm -hmm. um, it talks about all the different aspects of, of fungal things. It's totally entertaining. Um, I think your readers would really enjoy it. Thank you for that. That's awesome. I'm, I'm a person that buys tons of books because I'm, I, I love writing books, but I also, uh, I just love books. Speaking of, are, have you, can, are you working on a book right now? Um, a children's book, Michael Reilly. That's amazing. Thank you for doing this. So my, my, this is Michael wow. Rizzi, the wizard. Let's see if I can get this right. Whoa, whoa, this is awesome. So yeah, I write children's books too. This is amazing. I, if you need any information on like self-publishing, working directly with printers, you know, if you want my connection that other like New Society publisher, I'm friends with them. I'm a micro publisher. Um, so yeah, this is amazing. Uh, I'll get your uh, email from Peter and I can ask you some questions, but it's about, yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of ch book chapters that are almost finished. And so, um, but no, no books be planned, but I, I know that it takes a lot of, um, time and effort and you have to have parts of your day where you just write because it's tough with all the distractions in today's world to, to have the time to actually do the to do the writing and the research that goes into the writing so children's mm -hmm. book i have six grandkids so um it was mostly for them i mean they needed to know where their food comes from they needed to know you know how the soil works they needed to know that um how important these things are to the long-term health of the planet. So that's why I wrote it. It's almost done. We're just finishing up the illustrations now. Uh, Linda Gray is the, my illustrator. She's a friend and she's doing a great job with the, with these illustrations. And she's uh, very talented. Yes, she is. Absolutely. Wow. I'm so glad. I just felt like, I felt like I should ask because we need, I, I keep saying this, we need story-based education that's scientifically underpinned for younger kids so that they start thinking about, I mean, I had, I don't know if you remember this, but Value Tales, there was this set of Value Tales and it was all famous people and the values that you could get from their experience. And I mean, I read so many of those things and it's like, as a child, it's like, I valued science at the highest level. Like National Geographic was like my favorite thing to get in the mail. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you so much for doing that. And I, I can't wait to get a copy and then share it with the world. A few months, hopefully we'll have it out. So I want a signed copy. <laughs> Heck yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty involved. I mean, it's funny cause it's, you try and make it fun, all the things that Mike Rizzi do, like, you know, he's a conductor on a train, he's a wizard, he's, you know, uh, explorer, all the things that Mike different. So you dress him up like, you know, differently for different situations. You know, he's watering a plant with a thing and he's, you know, so we've got, we've got him in all these different little things that kids can relate to, like a minor, 
a carpenter. So all the different activities they do, he's they're wearing the outfits of a carpenter or, or a conductor on a train or whatever. So it, it's been fun to do. So hopefully they'll be able to relate to the different occupations that these they see with through this happy little guy doing this stuff out in the soil. So it's going to be interesting. Oh wow! I'm so excited. I will. I have. I have nieces and, and nephews aplenty, and I will be buying that and sending that out. And uh, maybe I'll even uh, send you one of my books and trade. Oh yeah, that'd be great. This is exchange information. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So there will be a lot of disappointed people in the chat if I don't uh, get some of their questions to you. You ready? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the number one uh, or the most frequently asked is the one I asked you a while back uh, when we were emailing and you were in Hawaii about trichoderma and mycorrhiza and their relationship and does is trichoderma like the T-Rex and it'll dominate or in nature are they symbiotic or yeah there's been a couple papers that have shown that they were incompatible with with mycorrhiza but you know there's also been quite a few papers that show that they actually one plus one equals three um so i don't know i don't know who's right or, or if it changes depending on the circumstance so I know that trichoderma can help really help control diseases in the soil. And then that gives a, a nice window for the mycorrhiza to be established and keep the disease from coming back. So, you know, in my view, my experience are pretty compatible. But again, I haven't kept up in the last five years with any new studies that have come out. But I know the research was mixed. Okay, so that's super interesting. Let me, I didn't uh, realize it was mixed. I thought it was all trichoderma. We got to be careful with using it. I think the levels of the trichoderma that they were using in some of the studies I, I saw was probably a thousand times higher than you would ever see in a soil. So that uh, was probably the reason why. And, you know, who knows, you know, if it's the level, uh, the concentration that's more important than the actual you know, presence or absence. I mean, you're never going to find a plant system that doesn't have trichoderma and mycorrhiza both present. They're always Whoa. together. They're always Whoa. together. I mean, Whoa! That's, that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty hard to sample soils and not get some trichoderma. So they, they occur, occur together in every plant you've ever seen in your life. So they do occur together. So I think the big issue is, you know, are the levels that people are adding them to their soils is that enough to have an adverse effect? Trichodermis are everywhere. That is fascinating. I mean, it's like, right, it's one of those things that isn't it like us. I wrote it down here. Um, everyone in labs expects this to show up like quite often, right? Isn't this that, that that's the microbe? Yeah, it all depends on, you know, it's just you can't find almost any soil material that doesn't have right all of the groups of micro all the groups of mycorrhiza trichodermas different bacterias even nitrogen fixing bacterias are present in soils at super low levels almost everywhere um so they're just ubiquitous in the environment it's just like you think five thousand years ago that the greeks added yeast to their wine to make their wine you know no there was just yeast floating around in the air constantly there were wild yeast i mean still today i mean there's you know yeast is everywhere so it's just floating around in the wind and there's trichodermis almost everywhere in soil unless you really sterilize your soil i mean you use methyl bromide you mean might knock them out for you know four weeks or something but they'll find a way to get back wow so here's a uh, kind of part two of the trichoderma mycorrhizal question. Uh, I'm curious to ask about how mycorrhizal fungi could survive in nature to exist today if trichoderma eats it, or does trich only eat it when starving? If the latter, can this happen in depleted soils? So if it has other food sources, does it uh, leave it alone? 
Well, I mean, I really, I really don't know. I mean, there's probably some parasitism going on constantly. Again, it's the level. And, you know, you do want, if you're, you do want mycorrhizal hyphae to degrade uh, and recycle all of the elements in, in that mycorrhizal hyphae, you want that back into the, back into the nutrient cycle. So you actually want some level of decomposition going on in the soil. You don't want, you know, trichodermis to actively attack live mycelial strands that are absorbing, you know, important nutrients for the plant. But as soon as they're done metabolizing, you know, we talked about earlier today about how the mycorrhiza will, you know, grow radially and then they'll find a nutrient source and they'll, they'll cut back the energy flow to the part of the radius that's no longer finding, you know, water or nutrients for the plant. And they'll focus all that energy and in growing into the, these pools of water or nutrients. Well, you need something to decompose that material in the back. That was there. That's why you want your trichodermis doing, you know, doing their action there. So you want decomposition. It's not, you know, what we need, what we really need is what, you know, we have departments of plant sciences everywhere. Every university has a botany department or plant sciences department. We need a department of fungal sciences to work out a lot of these details. You know, what, what university has the department of fungal sciences, you know? The Department of Mycorrhiza, you know, you just don't, you know, I would, I would contend that that would help us better understand some of these processes. And in my view, it's probably just the rate of trichoderma that was added in some of these studies was, you know, they were starving and there was lots of them and they had needed something to eat. So St. Bernard's Observation Booth on YouTube has a one, two, three, four part question. You ready? Sure. <laughs> uh, ask him about fungal energy channels and labile carbon, etc. Ask him about saprotrophic fungi in rhizosheets. Ask him about common mycorrhizal networks. Ask him about mycelium and construction. Well, actually, we'll save that one for later, but the first three. Any thoughts on one or all three? Uh, not so many thoughts on the first two because I'm really not knowledgeable in that way, but I am pretty knowledgeable about these common mycelial networks. Uh, with some of my first research was looking at the interaction between uh, Douglas fir and Pacific madrone and Arctostaphylus manzanita and how they shared a common mycelial network. We were not some of the first people to do that. And we actually showed that, um, that the mycorrhiza is supported by Arbutus, Madrone, and Manzanita actually help support the growth of Douglas fir uh, adjacent to them to become reestablished. And that was a big way that these conifers eventually recolonized these burned areas. And we also looked at biochar, which is from the fire, and we found that most of the mycorrhizal activity was tied up in the biochar. And the biochar were these mycelial little basically my cereal little air balls that were full of mycelium in the soil. And that was the focus point for the recovery following disturbance. So these common mycelial networks are a big deal. Um, I think most plants are this whole uh, competition thing in the plant world is probably a little bit overblown and there's more cooperation going on uh, beneath the soil surface than we would let on. And that's how, it's like the internet. That's how these plants talk is via these common mycelial networks. So that I do keep up on all the research there and I participated in some of that early in my career. So I think it's neat. That there's so many people doing it now. People thought we were crazy back, back then, you know, cause they wanted to kill all the hardwoods to grow conifers. So they were trying to poison them and we were saying, Hey, you got actually better regeneration next to the hardwoods that you do away from them. So why are we trying to kill these things? So um, it wasn't very popular back then, but it is popular now, which is a good thing. But um, yeah, the other stuff, uh, I wasn't quite sure what they were referring to. Okay, so... Um, sorry, let me find the... Uh, uh, 
it would be very interesting to hear what his thoughts are on harvesting indigenous microorganisms. Interesting. I, uh, I think it depends on if you're harvesting the fruits of those microorganisms or if you're harvesting the organisms. I think harvesting the organisms is probably a bad idea, but harvesting the reproductive bodies of those, like um, when you pick a mushroom, you're actually picking the fruit of the mycelium, just like you're harvesting the apple on the apple tree. And in some ways, I know um, mushroom hunters, we did a bunch of mushroom collection impact studies back in the 80s. And harvesting the mushrooms very carefully um, actually led to not less mushrooms, but actually more mushrooms. It wasn't significant, but it was nearly significant um, because they produced more fruiting bodies. Um, but raking to get those uh, fruiting bodies, the mushrooms or the truffles, had a real adverse effect because you're tearing up all the mycelium. So if you leave the mycelium intact, I think there's very little impact to harvesting the, the fruits of fungi or, or other microorganisms as long as you keep the basic organisms intact. So Blue of Green Tank uh, said, any opinions of, on foliar feeding companion and cover crops to affect their root exudate production to enhance soil fertility for cannabis sort of passive feeding? Um, I think it's again the level. I mean, if you if you foliar feed at high levels, um, the brood systems probably won't send out the signals for mycorrhiza to form or even form a lot of roots because they don't need them. So, um, I guess it depends on the level. I've seen uh, foliar feedings of micronutrients really stimulate a lot of mycorrhizal activity because sort of the limiting factor to growth, and then it was able to grow more roots which allowed more energy for the mycorrhiza to develop. So as long as you're not overdoing it, I don't think foliar feeding will exclude mycorrhiza, but if you do massive foliar feedings, you're not gonna end up with a very good root system. Got it, okay. Hold on. Let me get back to the question bin. Um, relationship of mycorrhiza to humic and fulvic acids positive <laughs> positive relationship they love the, all the surface area they love the slow release of nutrients they love time release uh, sources of, of nutrient availability the only thing it's a slow release or a time release the mycorrhiza like that and that's basically what you're getting in fulvic and humic acids. You're getting a lot of other things too, in terms of, you know, what they provide energy sources for other microbes, which might be influencing the mycorrhiza. But I mean, we we used to add humic and fulvics to the soil materials so we grew mycorrhiza. We used to add trichoderma as well. So um, I think there's probably some benefits to to doing that. Anytime we can put carbon in the soil. You know, there's more carbon in the soil than all the vegetation on Earth. So it's a huge sink of carbon. So anytime we can add organic carbon-based nutrients to the soil for long-term storage, it's a benefit. And... Uh... Blue also a while ago wanted to hear about the endophytic relationships versus mycorrhizal relationships, or he wanted the, the conversation to touch on that. Uh, ask me again, Peter. Blue, maybe you can clarify in the chat, but uh, endophytic relationships versus mycorrhizal relationships. Not quite sure what the question is. Right, we'll, we'll get a... We'll get a clarification on that one. Okay. Matt, Matt, any uh, questions from you based on the questions from the crowd? Uh, 
Um, well, I, I know where the language comes from in that first question. The um, fungal energy channel that comes from Christine, Dr. Christine Jones. Um, and that's aggregating all the fungal activity. And I mean, she her whole thing is that we need fun, we need mycorrhizal fungi. Um, the idea of label uh, carbon doesn't embrace the fact that there's a carbohydrate synthesis process within the plant. And then, so there's different kinds of sugars that get released, like monosaccharide versus polysaccharide, right? Uh, Non-reducing sugars or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and so the plant levels of health, like the plant health pyramid, like going through like carbohydrate synthesis, nitrogen synthesis, and then the two other uh, above layers that focus on um, microbiology and, and then plants releasing lipids through to the mycorrhizae um, for long-term sequestration of energy into the soil. Like that kind of stuff isn't addressed by that whole label carbon simplification aggregate. So, so, so the, I have, uh, I have issues with that perspective on it. <laughs> but just because of all those issues, right? I mean, I, I just see more detail in that space. So here, <laughs> so here is a, uh, what are his thoughts on using added activated charcoal to add space for microbes and fungi? So basically biochar. I love, I love it. I actually, if you ever want to do something really cool, take a piece of biochar and look at it under magnification. It is the coolest little soil particle ever. It's just a honeycomb. And it's really usually has like deposits of like glomalin on it. You know, it's kind of a sugary glue. They're just these really cool cave-like dwellings that are just going on endlessly and stuff. So I'm a big biochar fan. I think uh, there's a, some great articles on the terra preta soils from the Amazon where they created these ch char. Basically, they, they do grow. They burn trees under these low oxygen conditions, so they created charcoal at this at these high levels, and then they that became incorporated in the soils. To, to keep the phosphorus from leaching out of these Amaz Amazonian soils and make phosphorus available. And they grew all their food in these patches. It's called the terra preta soils. And it's a fast, and you can still see them from outer space. They're thousands of years old because they're more productive than the surrounding soils. So, I mean, that's, I think charcoal is really important, especially if it's lilifies, if it's, um, you know, created in a way that creates a lot of cavities because uh, that becomes storage places for microbes, mycorrhiza, and water. And then you have the whole thing with like, they hold three times their mass in water, um, according to some studies. So I've heard folks say that like five to 10%, five to 15%, yeah, come on in. Five to 15% of the soil medium can be biochar um but they're in specific, they're on the west coast and so i wonder if you've seen those rules shift with mycorrhizal inoculants maybe um does that make sense that's a good point i don't think you'd ever need more than five percent that's it's very good to hear. yeah i mean five percent would be maximum a little bit goes a long way because there are also these little nutrient holding sponges as well um but when I look at the research that I've seen above 5%, there was no added benefit. So, you know, save some money, but if you can get up to that 5% level, that's pretty incredible. Um, it's interesting to note too, that in terms of carbon sequestration, um, a healthy mycorrhizal plant system can sequester a thousand pounds of carbon per acre per year. Mm huge amount. Yeah. You start multiplying that times millions of acres. If we switch to regenerative agriculture, we could really make a difference in terms of global climate change. So for your generation, that's going to have to deal with all the problems that we created for you. The solution is regenerative ag. It's the 
the most cost effective, you're producing healthy food, you're increasing soil productivity for future generations, growing healthy food, and you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it in soil. And one of the ways you do that is add compost, add charcoal, uh, biochar, all these things. They're all, they're all part of the ants mycorrhizae and they produce their ability to produce glomalin, which is a molecule that's 40% carbon. Um, and that leaves a residue in the soil and it builds up over time. These are all, you know, it's not going to be a quick fix, but it's going to be a lot of different organic methods that I think are going to make the difference. Uh, I can't agree more. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> fo following up on the biochar stuff, uh, do you recommend inoculation of the biochar before mixing to the soil? Is it beneficial or possibly possibly detrimental to not inoculate? I, I think it would be a good carrier. I think yeah. you can inoculate the biochar because it's going to hold on to those little propagules that are going to get caught in the, the pores of the of the biochar. It's light, so it's easy to, you know, so it wouldn't take a lot of weight of material to inoculate a large area because it's so light. Um, so I think it would be a good inoculum carrier for sure. But I don't think it really matters if you use it as part of the process or not part of the process. So sprouted seed teas, AKA a blast of enzymes, good or bad for mycorrhiza, any danger of mycorrhiza colony collapse with big enzyme soil drenches. I love that. It should be on the cover of the Daily Inquirer or something. <laughs> it's a fantastically worded question. I don't know the answer to that, but I can see that checking out at Safeway. That is <laughs> kind of one of those things. Read that again. I, that was a beautiful thing to read. Uh, that was that was so good. Here we'll make it. I can make it nice and big. Hold on. Hold on. Boom. Sprouted seed. He's the black dead zombs going. Yeah, it's fantastic. It should be on the. It should be on the cover of the National Enquirer. <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer. Good or bad for mycorrhiza. It collapse. The colony collapse. Um. <laughs> I just love the question. I can't even come up with an answer, but that wins the question of the year thing right there. That's good. Mike, it has been amazing to meet you digitally. I have learned so much. I really appreciate, uh, Peter, you arranging this. This has been awesome. It's been great, Matt. I'm looking forward to exchanging information with you, too. I've got a couple things that uh, readers might want to read. I wrote a Mycorrhizae is not rocket science. Uh, I, I, I have the print copy of that. Your son sent it to me. <laughs> uh, that I'll send to your readers. It's it's pretty simple, but it... it oh, actually, you know what? I, I think I published that on... Uh, here, hold on. On the Future Cannabis Project. Hold on. Hold it's really on. good. I love, I love the art. Yes. Really beautiful. And I have a climate and uh, mycorrhiza and climate change paper that's in press. So as soon as that's published, I'll send that out to your readers too. It just talks about the role that mycorrhiza can, can play in mitigating the effects of climate change. So that should be out in a couple months. And then we can all spread that around with all your readers and stuff too. And then I'll make sure the children's book, you have access to the children's book. But so we, we have a that. website to sell it on, and everybody watching will pick up a copy if they have kids. Absolutely. So I, when, I when, you're, when you're ready for the book, if, if you uh, want to get a bunch down here, I will be your boutique, your old school boutique bookstore in addition to Amazon. There you go. Thank you. Carrying obscure titles um <laughs> my 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 wife just took a she walked outside to my actually let me throw this up this is actually pretty funny these are uh oh, hold on ah <laughs> give me one second 
There we go. This, this is what my wife just saw outside, and she goes, this is gross. Clean it up. <laughs> oh, man. And then she said, I can hear you. And then she said, I can hear you. Oh, my God. It's like she's standing right next to me. What? What? What is that? I just I'm trying to. I have it on my phone, so it's really small. It's it's a lot of it's bones that I had in the uh, composter that I'm letting uh, kind of dry out in the sun now and become more brittle, so I can break them up. Good source of phosphorus. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll have you talk to her and <laughs> she's not pleased with what's going on outside right now, but. Uh, <laughs> There was, hold on. oh, so do, do, do we, we, uh, we had someone uh, frantically writing a song in your honor. Is he ready? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to play, James? Yeah. Let's do it. So our working title before our placeholder title was Mike Arisal Man. I've never heard it either, so I will try not to mess anything up. I literally just finished wrote it and writing it. <laughs> I wrote the chorus as I walked in. I was like, oh, this is the right part. Okay. Okay. Give me a rhythm. Let me just sing for a minute. Okay. The wind is so Well, this is this is my son, James Powers. Uh, he is a self-taught musician. He's I mean, I've got pictures of him before he was one. And he's playing guitar even then. So he's a self-taught musician and this is a studio we share. And uh, this is what I used to do before I started, you know, writing books. <laughs> oh, you took my, you took the pedal. No, I took the pedal. Yeah, you took the pedal. Ah. I took the pedal off my pedal jam. Hold on. Yeah, so like the wind, the cold wind made everything go like a half step up, so it's in between like E flat and E. Well, you tune, I'll play. Is the word glomus anywhere in this song? I, I, he doesn't sing yet. I can't sing. I, I've tried. <laughs>
Thomas. <laughs> I wish I was a glumus aggregatum. Good job. Thank you. Jay. The You're acoustics welcome. were wonderful. <laughs> so actually, one, one last parting question, and then we'll let you go. Uh, and I forgot to ask it a while ago, but it's an interesting one. Uh, St. Bernard's Observation Booth uh, said, ask him about mycelium in construction and production of goods. Does he think mycelium pots can replace plastic ones in grow rooms? So kind of biomaterials and your hopes for mycelium on that front. Can you see my, my bear? Yeah, it's like a big gummy bear. Yeah, it's grown out of mycelium. Wow. Look at the back part. Beautiful. Yeah, and I grew a pot. I'll show you the pot. Oh, cool. Right out of mycelium. Wow. I have, I made, I dig healthy soil. I dig healthy soil coasters. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I got bags of Ganoderma and turkey tail uh, growing in my little lab right now. I, I think there's so much potential for replacing plastics and especially styrofoam right now with growing mycelium. It's such not, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So, I mean, <laughs> if, if the mycelium, the PhD and uh, with mycelium, domain, 40 years of research experience can do it. Anybody can do it. <laughs> but I'm just saying it, it was so much fun to do. Um, it's going to happen. It's just there's going to be a wave of people. Did that you, was that turkey tail you said or what did you say you? The big ones are Pleurotus, which is the angel wings, turkey tail, Tremedes, and Ganoderma, which is the Rishi. They're, they're all white rod fungi. They're super aggressive. Um, the energy source, I mean, you're basically growing it on wood chips. Right now I'm like um, experimenting with super fine sawdust because the, this is super strong and light, but it's not, um, it's not fine enough where you could do, really do like finer material like you know you couldn't do like s statues or sculptures or stuff like that i just want to experiment what i can i want to see if you can make chopsticks out of these things you know something strong and, and long but um you know you just need a mold and you grow the fungus in the mold and stuff but i think uh dell computers are going to this uh as, as replacement of styrofoam for the packing of all their um computers so wow. styrofoam's bad. I mean, plastic. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. I'm curious how long um, my plastic pot is super rigid. Um, I've been growing those plants for about a month now, but I'm not seeing yeah, zero deter deterioration of the pot. It's just it's going to happen. It's it takes some energy to produce it because you need an energy source. You need like 
you know, you need to feed the fungus to grow onto the sawdust or the, the bark chips. Hemp fiber chips are probably what's being used by most people. Hmm. So they're using hemp chips as the as the substrate. The mycelium are really strong and they bind everything together. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but I'm pretty excited about this field right now. No, you did. And, and have you been following MycoWorks at all with the leather? Yeah, there's actually a food substitute too that they're working on where they would actually grow, you know, use the fungus to grow food, uh, meat substitutes and stuff. So yeah, the leather I think would be, you know, a lot more humane in terms of, you know, animals, you know, you're growing fungus, making a little fungus instead of, you know, animals. So yeah, I mean, this is just great potential for all kinds of things. Furniture, super light, super strong. Um, I'm dipping my stuff into various things to make it harden, you know, and painting, painting it. And I'm having, a, I'm having a blast. I love it. And, and w would you ever uh, saute up that coaster after you use it as a coaster? Well, Ganoderma is Rishi, so it's really an antiviral, anti-cancer thing. So yeah, I would take a bite of it. I wouldn't wouldn't hesitate. <laughs> it tastes like a rice cake. It looks like a rice cake, but it probably tastes like sawdust because that's the substrate. But right, what's the I would make tea. Apple? <laughs> that way, it wouldn't hurt my teeth. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's a strong. And and Blaze Daily wants to know what your spirit animal is. That's a good question. Probably mycorrhizae. <laughs> How about what's your what's your spirit fungi? Do you do you have a favorite one? Oh, um, God, that's a really good question. You know, probably tuber melanosporum, the French black truffle. Um, we did a lot of inoculations with the French black truffle on hazelnuts and oak, and it is beautiful. It is the coolest fungus. It's just it's kind of like a furry brown bear. It's just really it's really beautiful. So. I never really thought about it, but it would be tuber melanosporum, the French black. Did you lose me? Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much. I've really appreciated you taking the time. <laughs> Matt, it was fun. I know. Sorry, I, I was muted. I, I was just saying I was looking up the French black, and it's it's. Uh... It's the it's the one you shave on the food, right? Just uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I had a, a friend, a little, little potato. Yeah, I had a friend who used to get those. He was a chef in New York City. That's the only time I ever got to taste those things. Unbelievable. Yeah, they're expensive, but they're worth it. It's it's a special treat for sure. All right. Well, we thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully you'll be back again soon. Yeah, Peter and Matt, I'll, uh, we'll exchange some information. I'd love to see the book and see the other things that you've written. So um, looking forward to that. Thank and, you so and, much. And, and when do you think your book will be, uh, there will be many copies available to, the, to, the, to your adoring fans? I'm uh, hoping in the next three months. So that would be great. Okay. So kind of midsummer-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All Thanks, right. Man. Yeah. Good talking to you. You too. And always, thank you, everyone. Always fun. Always fun. And I think I think tomorrow morning we have uh, Dragonfly Earth Medicine, uh, and that's about all I know so far. <laughs> they're, so. they're good. They're a good company. Okay. Thanks, right. everyone. Have all right. A good thank one. You. Bye. Bye.